Well, good morning. If you would, go ahead and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2 this morning. And as you are turning there, I do want to uh, take a moment and just say a quick thank you. Uh, it always uh, humbles me and catches me off guard when uh, you, the church family, take into account that uh, someone decided that October would be Pastor Appreciation Month. Uh, and so I just want to pause and say thank you to all of you all for loving my family and I the way that you do uh, and that we are extremely grateful uh, for that. Uh, the cards and, and just the well wishes and so many other things were a sweet grace uh, to my family and I this past month. As we get into Hebrews chapter 2 where we have actually already begun last week, we come to an amazing section of God's Word. But before we get into it, I do want to just look back again at the flow of the author. We've been talking about this. That this is a sermonic form epistle. It's, it's unique in that way. And, and you'll see that more fully. I've encouraged you to, as you do your own study and preparation for the Word taught this morning and in and, and the Lord's Day's morning, uh, that you would read it in bigger sections than we would normally encourage, that to see the flow and the fullness of what the author is intending in this. And when I, when I think about that, there's a quote that comes to mind. I don't know exactly who to attribute it to. There have been multiple ones uh, over the years that I've, I've heard it from. Even physically, I've had men say this uh, in, in different classes and things. And, and I think it's such a wonderful way of, of understanding this. And it's, it's, it comes in two forms. I've heard it said in this way, uh, that it is a, the work of the preacher, or I've heard it said it is the work of the pulpit. Two, comfort the afflicted. And to afflict the comfortable. And I think that's a good understanding of, of how God's word and, and the teaching of God's word and the role of a shepherd is to be carried out. Now if you've been reading ahead, what you have likely come to recognize is this is a regular rhythm for the author in the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, last week we got some afflicting. And you'll see that there's a great deal of encouragement, but he pauses quite frequently and gives very stern warnings, very clear and even I would say almost severe warnings in the book of Hebrews. And so there's some, a lot of comfort for our affliction, but there is also a good deal of affliction for our comfort. And, and that's a good balance as you've been reading this. And, and we saw last week there was some afflicting. As he breaks from his teaching in chapter 1 into chapter 2 uh, about the exaltation of Christ. Uh, and he does so to warn. Right? Well, we saw that last week. He, he breaks from the exaltation of Christ to warn the listeners against not paying attention to these truths much closer. And in fact drifting away from them. Listen again to verses 1 through 4 of Hebrews chapter 2. For this reason, in other words, he's been exalting Christ and, and displaying the true exaltation of Christ in comparison to angels. And what he's saying is you cannot come to the conclusion that Jesus is better and then not act on that truth. That truth has to have action displayed in your life. And so he tells us that in verse 1 down to 4. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. And so he gives a grave warning, a pause moment that says, don't just soak these things in. Don't just nod your head in agreement. These demand action from the listeners who are believing them to be true. So we had a moment of affliction for our comfort last week. But here we move in and he's encouraging us greatly by displaying to us what is the benefit, what is the, the depths or the bounds, are there bounds to the benefit for those who have trusted in Christ as their Lord and Savior. And he's going to bring some amazing, the, the comfort that he brings here is, is otherworldly. 
it is outside the bounds of the, the natural things that you and I could arrive at and conclude. And he brings that to us. It's an amazing study in what the Word of God offers to all those who are willing to labor in their study of it. Right? This is not received by osmosis. I wish, but you can't. You cannot go to sleep at night and lay this under your pillow and it just creep in. Right? That's not how this works. God did not design it that way. He labored, uh, he gave the design that he would reveal himself through the written word. Now we have natural revelation through creation whereby God is revealing certain attributes of his, but supernatural revelation by which man can and must be saved is only given through the written word. And then the proclaimed word that flows out of the truth of the written word. We must pay much closer attention to these things that have been given. You will not look at a sunrise and see Jesus. You will see the created realities and majesty and magnificence of God, but you will not see the atoning work of the Son on your behalf so that you might be redeemed. You have to go to the Word of God to know those truths. And those who will labor in their study of it, it unfolds. It's, it has no ending. It's, it's unfathomable. It has no depth that we can ever plumb to the fullness of it. And as we dig in, we, we learn in layers the beauty and grace and provision and preparation and planning and care of our Heavenly Father. It's an extremely simple text. What we're going to look at today, there's not a truth when we get to the end of it that's going to be something that's very shocking to you. There's not, the point of this text is not something that's, that's really apart from basic Christian doctrine. But it comes across as complex. Many people read this and skip right past it, it because it builds out of a comprehensive understanding of the Word of God. In other words, the author makes an assumption in this, that this truth is for those who have trained themselves by the eating of meat and the laying aside or moving beyond the milk of God's word into greater things. You'll see that a little bit later in Hebrews chapter 5 and in chapter 6. And there's this assumption that there is a basic understanding of the creation design of God. That there is a basic biblical understanding of the fall of man, the curse of sin, the futility that this world is subjected to, and a biblical basis for those things. It, there's, a, there's a comprehensive foundation that says that, that there will be an understanding as we can go to the Psalms and we can see uh, the quotation from Psalm 8, which was read earlier, that we will know these things. You see... It builds out of a comprehensive understanding. And too many people, sadly, who profess the name of Christ do not have a comprehensive understanding of God's word. They have a, they have a very superficial understanding of the creation order, the creation uh, story, the creation account. They have a very superficial understanding of the law and the nation of Israel and the old covenant and the new covenant. They have a very superficial understanding of the totality of God's plan and God's word. And so they come to a text like the one we're in this morning and it just goes right over and as it goes over, they miss the blessing of it. They miss the grace of it and the beauty and the goodness that it contains for us. You see, the intent is very simple. Here's the intent. I'll give it to you ahead of time. God has a wonderful plan for man, his creation. But man, his creation, is absolutely determined to make a mess of it. All of it. But God's wonderful plan for man will still happen in spite of man's mess because God is greater than man. That's the intent of our text. That's what the author is conveying. And can I say that is a needed message. That's a message that we need to, to hear. We need to take in. We need to uh, soak into the cortex of who we are so that it can then become the action response to what we experience and, and see. I mean, have you ever looked around and thought, man, this is beyond fixing? I know, it's a shock, right, that, that that would ever cross anyone's mind. Have you ever felt overwhelmed and almost alone even in this world and in, in your life that you're, you're called to? And let's not leave the mess out there in the political and social realm, right? It's not everyone else's fault. We also contribute mightily to these things. And if we pull it in close, we recognize that certainly there are times in every one of our lives where we have made a mess of things. And where we can't see our way out. We, we look and we think, oh my goodness, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. This is beyond me. I don't even know in the moment ahead. 
We feel overwhelmed. We feel insignificant. We feel small and incapable. And to be clear, in the original audience this was written to, there was a measure where they were feeling a good bit beat up and overwhelmed for their faith specifically. We, we talked about this before, but it was not easy to be a Hebrew, to be a Jewish man or woman back then. It's not an easy time in the life of the nation of Israel. There has not been a lot of easy times, and this certainly was not one of them. They were a conquered people under Roman authority, rule, and subjugation. And it was, it was pretty rough. It was brutal. If there was a questioning of Rome's authority, there was a brutal death that followed directly thereafter. Then for them to be a believing Jew, a Christian Jew, a Messianic Jew as we would say today, this did not relieve Roman oppression. It was not like by trusting in Christ the oppression of Rome was removed. By no means. It was increased. We saw this under Nero where he blaming the believers for his own actions brought massive persecution specific to those who had Christian faith. And more than that, you were a subjugated, conquered people. And as is often the case, you had therefore built small communities around your lifestyle, faith, and heritage in the towns or the Roman cities in which you lived. And now as a believer, a Christian, you were no longer a part of the Jewish faith. And so you were separated even more from anything of comfort in society. And you have to understand, well, you say, well, but that's not, no. Judaism is unique in this. And more so than many other national heritages, Judaism was at the center of all of Jewish life. From their diets, to their schedules, to their social calendars, to their social life. Judaism, the, the temple and the law were paramount to everything that they had grown up knowing and doing. And suddenly... They're separate from even that, under great persecution, under great struggle. And their faith had called them out from all of it. And they were struggling. They were struggling not to return to it. They were struggling to, to see rightly the goodness and grace and provision and promise of God in the midst of their flesh and their circumstances that were surrounding them. They were a bit overwhelmed. And they needed some encouragement. Now last week we saw the warning. And what I want to say is the warning is a great encouragement also, by the way. Hey, right? If you're a believer here today, then you are in the race. You, you have entered into the fight against sin. You are putting to death, as Colossians 3 says, that which is earthly within us. Christ himself says you have to be one who will pluck out and cut off in your fight against sin. In Hebrews 12, we'll see a little bit further that we have not yet resisted sin to the shedding of blood, the way that the author, the captain, the finisher of our faith, Christ himself, has done. We need to fight against sin. And a warning is a great encouragement if you're rightly seeing that. I mean, listen, maybe it's just me. But I need some warnings of the bad things that can happen to keep me where I ought to be. And I need some reminders of the good that awaits me to keep me where I ought to be. This is a work of the Spirit. This is a grace from God. And so if you're like me in that way, this message is for you. Read with me beginning in verse 5, our text for this morning, down to verse 9. I really wanted to go to verse 10, but it's a transition verse, and I didn't want to open the door into everything that comes after it. So we're going to stop in 9 this morning. Verse 5, for he did not, and that term for tethers it back. It's, it's, it's a smaller version of therefore. For he did not subject to the angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet, for in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. This is a timely message in so many ways.
both for the original audience who were receiving this under the persecution and separation that their faith was bringing upon them, but also for us, for every generation truly. It's, it's not something that's unique to us. Every generation of those who live by faith, recognizing that they are still in this world but are no longer of it, need to hear this truth, this encouragement. And the author is showing how they, while they are under the thumb of the Roman Empire, while they are rejecting their own traditions and thus rejected by their countrymen, feeling pretty overwhelmed and insignificant, the author is just reminding them that Christ in his amazing superiority, remember that's a theme of Hebrews, Jesus is better, in his amazing superiority has given them massive significance in God's good plan for this world to come. That's a big deal. And I think we miss this. This this is a solid lesson, by the way, for the church today. Because so often the church is looking for ways to be significant. To matter to the world. Our significance is massive, but it is found in Christ. Therefore, Christ must always be the focus of our significance. Of our pursuit of that. If, If there's a ministry that's aiming to make something other than him significant themselves or some other element of what they're doing or think that they're doing well, then they have drifted. They have drifted significantly from what the Lord has called us to. He must be our focus. And he goes back to angels, by the way. He's not done with that. He, he took a break in the first four verses to warn, to warn against not paying attention to the fullness of what he's teaching, but he's back to the superiority of Christ over angels. Look at verse 5. Here they come again. For he did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. Now, we spent a lot of time in chapter 1 understanding more fully what is an angel. Not culturally, not traditionally, not mythologically, but biblically, what is an angel? And we recognize these are amazing creations of God who administer his will here on earth. Right, one, one commentator pointed to uh, the, the dream of Jacob, Jacob's ladder, where you see the angels going up and going down and, and going from heaven to earth and from earth to heaven and carrying out the, the, the plan of the, the Lord into this world. They administer his will here on earth and they do so with great power and strength, don't they? When we read the accounts of angels' intervention, when, when, when they on behalf of God and the plan of God and the will of God are sent to intervene, oh my goodness, they wipe out. 186,000 wiped out in an evening, an army put in disarray and, and sent on its way. An entire town where 20 miles away, Abraham looking to the, to the valley of Sodom and to the city of Gomorrah, or to the valley of Gomorrah and the city of Sodom, saw as though a furnace were there, smoke rising When angels intervene, it is amazing. They wipe out and they protect. They they watch over. We we have the account of Elisha and his servant and the fear of the servant from the men who came to do them harm and the lack of fear in Elisha and the confusion over it. And Elisha says, open his eyes, Lord. And he, he looked out again and he saw the chariots of men surrounded by the chariots of angels. And he was no longer afraid. They wipe out and they protect. They bring good news. And they bring bad news. They are, they are messengers to do what is God's will. They are a significant force in carrying out God's plan. As a matter of fact, they are so significant, so powerful, so holy, and so good at what they do in administering God's plan, I think it would be natural for us to expect them to kind of do that always. For us to always be, we've talked about this, that if an angel would have appeared in the service last week, it would have had a significant effect upon we, the listeners, the hearers, to what that angel, that messenger had to say if he revealed himself in the fullness of who he was. Right? If we would have seen him in the way that the shepherds saw the angels singing the herald of the birth of Christ, it would be a significant moment in each of our lives In the same way, I think that at times it would be a natural assumption that when we get to heaven, angels are just going to still be amazing, right? When when we're in heaven, that angels are going to be these amazing, powerful, greater than creatures. That in God's economy and God's plan, that, that we're always going to be just a little lower than angels. 
But the author says that's not how it's going to be. And he brings forth this amazing encouragement and truth. He said angels are not going to rule the world which is to come. And you have to ask yourself, well, wait a minute. If, if not angels, these amazing, powerful, holy creations of God, then, then what of God's creation will be in charge? What is more significant than angels in God's administration? What is greater than them? And the answer is quite simple. The answer is man. Man. And we need to draw this out because that is the big truth from this that, that should land heavily. That is the understanding in the midst of a culture that says you are insignificant and tiny and a minority and you don't matter and you believe crazy things and you have missed out on all that the world has to offer by your faith. You need to hear what is God's plan for you in the future. It's amazing that the future redeemed world will be ruled by God's redeemed people. You and I. That is God's ultimate plan. That is the fullness of his plan. That's what the author is speaking of in the world which is to come. It's not angels who will carry these things out. This had to be a bright spot of encouragement. For these poor, insignificant people under Roman oppression. And kinsman rejection. Feeling very much alone. And overwhelmed in their season of life. And the author explains this amazing truth. Because you can't just make a statement like that. You need to back it up. You need to be able to say well this is why. And he does so by he explains this truth about God's ultimate or future plan. He begins by pointing back to God's original plan. Our first point in understanding what is God's ultimate plan for us. Is seen in what is God's original plan for us. He does this by quoting Psalm 8. Listen, we, Brother Bill read this for us earlier. You, you followed along either on the screen or in your own copy of God's Word. But here the author is quoting from that in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 down to the beginning or, or first half of verse 8. Listen to these words. But one has testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. The beginning of verse 8. You have put all things in subjection under his feet for in subjecting all things to him he left nothing that is not subject to him. Now before we go to Psalm 8 to see this more fully I have to address the beginning of this verse. It, it's funny but it's unique and it's not really found expressed this way anywhere else in scripture. Where the author says in, in verse 6, but one, someone, an unnamed source has testified somewhere. Right? It's this question, who, I mean, you have to ask, who is this guy? We, we've kind of been asking that, not in too much seriousness. I did at the beginning lay out what I believe is the authorship of this and, and walk through some of the other uh, possibilities. But this has to call us to mind again, who, who is this guy? Can, can this person really be qualified to write a letter to the Hebrews and not know that King David said this in Psalm 8? Is that possible? Is that something that we would... So we do need to answer that. We need to look at this. And there are a few good theories and there are a lot of really bad ones. I'm just going to share my top two. And both are possible. Not necessarily that either one is, is it, but both are possible. And, and these are the ones that I look to. Number one, this is a very popular view among faithful men. In its written form, the author is taking all pains to focus his hearers on who is the true author of Scripture. That it's God. And not the human instrument at all and in any way. Thus he does not name himself anywhere in our letter. Nor does he attribute the quote to any man. But rather he simply calls on scripture as a testifier to these truths. Now that's very possible and that, that would make sense. And, and I'm certainly not against that. I do think sometimes that we, we overthink the use of human instruments as, as God's penman in this. It's amazing. We do recognize that all of Scripture is God breathed, but He chose to use human instruments. Especially, this becomes clear when you look at some of the original language writings. 
when Peter writes, it looks nothing like when Paul writes. When James writes, it's very different. And so you see the human instrument in God's good and perfect plan that would carry out these things. And this is kind of where I lean more fully. We, we've taken the stance that this is sermonic in its form, that possibly even it's, it's, it's notes that were taken by one who listening to a sermon took these down in a manuscript type form and was then sending it forward to this small church of, of Hebrew believers. And to me, this is the more simple answer. It's in sermonic form. Again, possibly even taken down from an actual sermon taught. And it is possible that the author knew the text, but couldn't remember the exact reference in the moment. Now, again, I might be leaning a little bit experientially here. But I have certainly had that happen, where, where in the moments, even in the moments of, of working through a point in my sermon preparation that's, that I'm excited about and other things, I'll jot down. It's somewhere in Psalms, I'll have to look it up later, but remember this, and I can quote the verse. Oftentimes my memorization of verses will be something like this. I know that it's somewhere in Colossians and it's on the right hand page about three quarters of the way up. Right? There are moments in the midst of this, and I think sometimes people are, are looking at the Word of God and they're thinking, well, this is done in the same way that a pastor prepares a sermon and sit down with lots of study and conclusions drawn, and then, then the author... No. Moved by the Spirit, these men spoke and wrote these things down. Preserved by the Spirit, they have been given to us today. And so it is not even a stretch for me to believe that the author was simply in the moments of this referencing, I know it says it somewhere. And, and, and that's very possible. I would say both are possible. And, and neither one is cavalier nor lackadaisical. But the real point is found in the quote itself from Psalm 8. Turn with me back to Psalm 8. It won't be on your screen. Uh, it might be if they want to put it up there. But in Psalm 8, there's a few points I want to look at, having read through that earlier. Uh, the psalmist is, is King David. <clears throat> this is a psalm of David. And it's a psalm of praise and recognition, exaltation of the Lord and recognition. As a matter of fact, my title for this in, in my Bible is The Lord's Glory and Man's Dignity. The Lord's Glory and Man's Dignity. And I want to look at this and understand what is going on in this psalm that the author of Hebrews is quoting. Well, it begins in verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There's this exaltation, this recognition of the Lord our God, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. And then we get down to verse 3 and, and following, and, and the psalmist is basically explaining why we have the quotation that the author of Hebrews gives us. He says, when I consider your heavens, and when I look at your creation, the work of your fingers, hmm, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. So verse 3 is the basis for the quotation that we have in the book of Hebrews. The psalmist, King David, is looking around. He's going, God, you are amazing. God, just the glimpse I have of you in your creation displays your majesty and your splendor. God, you are above all things. God, by your voice you have created this thing, th th all things. God, you are Amazing. He's worshiping God. He's recognizing who God is. But then it, it causes him to pause and ask the question, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, when, when I look at the moon and the stars, just a small part of creation which you have ordained, the question comes to me, verse 4, what is man? What is man that, that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him. Now that's not a reference in a messianic sense. That's just a reference to the reality of, of humanity. Who is man? Who, what is humanity that you would take care of him, that you would look to him? And yet not only do you look to him, you've made him only a little lower than God. You crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands and you have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen and the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. Lord, you have done great and exceedingly amazing things on behalf of man and I don't understand it. When I look at what you have done in creation and then I look at humanity, I am boggled. I am humbled. I am awed. 
that you would do this. And this is important for us to understand. The psalmist David is contemplating the massiveness of God's creation in the heavens and the earth. And he can't help but wonder. What is man that you would care for him? And not only care for him, but that you would put this creation world that you made in subjection to him. And the psalmist in these two truths is utterly astonished at God's plan for man. And this knowledge of God's plan was not out of experience alone. We're, we're going to talk about that in a minute. It's not as though David experienced total authority and subjugation of all things. It's not as, all, as though all the beasts of the field and the fowl of the air came and knelt before his throne and recognized his authority that led him to state these things. No. Where did David have this knowledge from? Some experience, yes, but very limited and in fact very broken, very futile in many ways. No, it was given because it was God himself had declared his plan from the beginning and recorded it through his servant Moses that we might know it. In Genesis chapter 1, and this is where it takes into account from Genesis really to Revelation, all the fullness of the whole counsel of God and his word. The, the author of Hebrews is putting these truths out here and they just zip right over us in our modern day. And they shouldn't. They shouldn't. We should have a comprehensive dot connected recognition of the fullness, the whole counsel of God so that we might know him more fully and in so knowing him we might worship him more completely. And that's who we ought to be. This is what we saw in, in, earlier. You got to pay closer attention. It don't just come and say, feed me, give me some milk so I can survive and get through. No, your, your spiritual condition is supposed to thrive and grow and be strengthened and achieve the fullness of the maturity, which is in the stature of Christ himself. You're not supposed to be a baby. If you have a child, if you're a parent here today, even one who has grown children, then I want you to picture how perplexed, how worried, how concerned you would be if they were 10 years old and still eating from a, a, a bottle. Right? If they were 15 and still not carrying out things, you would recognize, whoa, there's, there's some uniqueness to this. Right? And in the same way, we look at this and there's so many believers professing Christians today who are comfortable looking to their heavenly father and talking baby talk and eating baby food and acting like children rather than knowing the fullness of the maturity and strength and goodness and significance and completeness and promise and provision. If you want peace that passes understanding, you got to know what is God's future plan for us. Or else it will always escape you and you will always wonder, what is this peace that passes uh, all understanding that I can't seem to quite bring to bear? I live scared. I live worried. I live this. I live that. Because you don't know God in the fullness of his plan. And he's made it available. He wants you to know it. He, he wants you to be able to, to look at circumstances that come our way and things that are outside of our control and say, he's still on the throne and I know his plan, and I know what he has for me. That's the peace that God has for us. That's the fullness of it, and we need to get after that. That's what the author of Hebrews is calling this little church that he originally wrote the letter to, and through the Holy Spirit, us today, to the fullness of. And he's referencing back to the beginning. In the beginning, in God's original creation, verses 26 to 28 of Genesis chapter 1, familiar words, but let's think about them in the context of what we're reading. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea. This might sound familiar to what David just said in Psalm 8. Let, him, let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You see, the psalmist knew that this is how God had viewed man in his creation because God told the psalmist that in his word. And when we read this, can I just say to you, God's original plan for his creation is astonishing. It's astonishing, especially with what we have learned in our day. I mean, think about this for a moment. King David had some grasp on the enormity of God's creation. 
He could look to the skies, to the stars, to the heavens. And maybe, maybe we could make the case that because there wasn't all of the ambient light and other things that we experience. If you've ever been out on the ocean and looked at the stars, they are more splendid. If you've ever been away from some of the light sources that are, that are in a city then, and, and you look up at the heavens, you, you do see them more uh, fully and, and more splendidly, more majestically. But none of that compares to the way you see it through the Hubble telescope. Right? There's a measure where we now have a greater grasp than the psalmist had. We now have a greater understanding when we read Genesis 1 and we connect that to what we now know. It ought to boggle us, astonish us, make us humble and ask the question the psalmist asks even more. Not less. We, we must pay much closer attention because here's what happens, and this is so mind-boggling to me. We have a greater grasp on the enormity and complexity of God's creation. And rather than boggling us, humbling us, what it's done is, is it's made us come to a place to forget God and think that he is one just like ourselves, as we're told about in Psalm 50, which is not a good thing to do. We forget God, and we relegate him to being like us, and he's not. And when you look at the heavens, when you consider the works of his hands, your response ought to be worship and humility. Your response ought to be praise and faith. Oh God, you are maintaining the perfect position of the earth on its axis in such a way that the sun and other things are not destroying it. Oh God, you are majestic. You are beyond my comprehension. And God, you have done these things perfectly who am I that you would look to me? Who am I? Someone thanked me uh, for, for something I had said. I don't know if it was a sermon or what. And my response when I'm thinking rightly is it always amazes me that God would use me to do anything for him. It, to be a resource in any way. To be a blessing to anyone. I know me. I know me. And God knows me. And God still uses me. That's the promise of these things. That's what the psalmist is, is recognizing. Can we not pause this morning in recognizing that the advancements of true and genuine science ought to increase our awe and our wonder about our creator and his love for us? Not diminish it. Not call it into question. Not relegate a, a merging of the two in any way, shape, or form. An increase of worship is what should flow out of that. The psalmist is boggled that the God of creation would care for man at all. And he goes into detail about how significant man is to God and his plan. Verse 7, you, you have made him for a little while lower than the angels. Again, that goes back to that future promise. We are at this point lower than the angels. They are amazing creatures, amazing creations. And we are in some ways lower than them. But it's not permanent. It's not eternal. There's a glorified reality, a glorification that awaits all of us. That, that when we see Christ as he truly is, then for the first time, we will know what we are going to be. Right? That's the promise of Scripture. Man is lower than the angels. And in a few ways, we experience death. Angels do not die. We looked at this before. His physical realm is both fragile and limited. My, we do not have the capacity, capability physically that angels do. He goes on and says, but you have crowned him with glory and honor. Now, now the question, how has God done this? Well, the first, and this is the big deal. This is what is so under attack today with all of the foolishness regarding gender and with all the foolishness regarding sexuality and with all the foolishness regarding race and with all the foolishness that is sweeping through our world today, it is a direct attack on this singular truth. And we miss it. We miss it. How has God done this? Well, he's done this by making them in his image. Who's them? Us. This is the reality of who we are. This is such a big deal and Satan has labored so hard to cheapen it. To make it not a big deal, the Imago Dei, the, the reality that you and I are created in the image of God, but we also have inherited the image of Adam. And so there is a, a damage to it, a twistedness to it, a sinfulness to it, a tainting to it, a lessening of it, a limitation to it. 
We don't oftentimes think in these ways, but can you imagine the capacity for thought and, and creativity and intelligence that existed in Adam just in the naming of every creature? That task is mind-boggling if we pause for just a moment and think about it. We just, oh, that was cool. Move on. No, pause and think about this. It's such a big deal. We, we want to believe man is wonderful just because. Because we are one. Therefore, we want to believe it's, it's, man is wonderful. But man is wonderful because he is made in God's image. That's what makes man special. That's what elevates him above all the rest of God's creation. That man is created in his image. And we live in a society and a culture that has cheapened human life. That has cheapened human significance. And the author is reminding us that human beings are the crown of God's creation. It's important. This is important when we live in a society that says, that says life means nothing and, and that only productivity is what matters. And then we have all the foolishness that says, oh no, I'm special because I say so. No, you're not. No, I'm not. I'm special because God said so. And, and we need to teach our children that. We, we need our children to not be looking to culture in the world to find their specialness, their uniqueness. If they would but look to God, they would know the fullness of all that he has created. And they would not chase after cultural ridiculousness as a means of of promoting self, they would be able to look to self and see the fullness of God's grace upon them, his promise, his provision, and all that he's given. We miss that. And we miss that because we don't see these truths. God made them in his image, and then he walked with them day by day. You don't think that you have a place in God's plan? You don't know how he began it. If you don't understand the fullness of what God has given to you and who you are unto him, then you don't know the fullness of the good news of his redemption in the midst of your rebellion. Every time we look at how God handles his creation, man, my goodness, we see massive significance, massive importance, massive promise, massive hope. But we live in a world that says, oh no, there's none of that. Live for the moment. Live for what the world offers. Live for what you can grab hold of and lay up for yourself here and then leave to someone else that they might do with it as they see fit. Our society has cheapened these things. Look at their God-given authority. Hey, just think about in God's original creation, if you want to know the significance of humanity, look at the authority that he gave them and have appointed him over the works of your hands. I made it and I'm giving it to you. That's amazing. I wish I had time this morning to go into that. But we don't. Verse 8, beginning, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, lowercase h, he left nothing that is not subject to him. And that's a strong, strong statement. It's a little bit of a struggle. But let's go back to original creation. Adam and Eve as humanity's representatives were declared the king and queen of God's creation. Right? They're his vice regent into his creation. They were given this authority. Everything was put in subjection under them. It's God's original plan. We can see that. We know that to be true because we can go back to Genesis and read the word of God as he declares these things to be true. That they and their children and their children's children would care for and rule over the world which God had created. It's God's original plan. And the author points to it as a basis for understanding our place of significance before God. If you look at society and you look at culture and you look at the things around, you're going to feel pretty insignificant. But if you look to God's word and you understand what is his intention from the beginning and you understand what was his design for you from the beginning, man, what encouraging truths these are. Now you might be saying, well, all that was well and fine for the Garden of Eden, but it sure isn't looking great today. Right? And you would be right. You might be saying, I have a really hard time ruling over my two-year-old. And just making my schedule come true is beyond my abilities almost every single day. I don't know about all this subjugation and rule and authority, but I'm just not seeing it. Now, the author is not ignorant of the mess we have made of God's original plan, right? Genesis chapter 3, if we had time this morning, we could go there and say, this is no mystery. It's not some mystery why things are the way they are. Romans chapter 5, it continually walks through these truths. And the author is not ignorant of that. 
And that's our second point. Man, man has messed up royally. And that's what you see at the end of verse 8. But now, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. Oh yeah, this is God's design. This is God's intent. And he lays that out by quoting from the psalmist. But then he tells us with all clarity. But this isn't the way it is. We don't yet see this truth. It's not the way it is. There, It was that way. Something messed it up. I can't imagine what. And then from that being messed up, there's a future hope of restoration to it. And I feel a little bit like we've been set up. I mean, the author just reminded us that God created man and made all the rest of his creation subject to man. And I think there's an expectation from the author to say, oh, that sounds great. It might be supposed to be that way, but it isn't. I may want to rule over creation. I may have been created to, which explains maybe why I want to. But the truth is I don't. The truth is we don't. Now, this is something that becomes clear to me almost every day. Right? There's hardly a day that goes by that I'm not reminded that I'm, I'm not in charge over hardly anything. Uh, but I remember one particular instance where this became really clear to me. When I was a young man, I must have been about 20, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do long term. And I was working in construction and other things. And it wasn't my desire for the long term goals of my life. And as an unbeliever, you know, I was looking to cultural, worldly, what will most satisfy, most fulfill, most pay the bills, most make me happy, those things. And so I was trying out at this time being a farrier. Uh, if you're not familiar with what a farrier is, I was uh, one who took care of horses' hooves. Uh, from, from putting shoes on them to trimming them to dealing with injuries and other things. And people who keep horses would, would pay for, for me to come and do that. Anyhow, I was pretty early on in this, and I got a call from a dear lady who told me she had a very special animal that needed my expert attention. Listen, she buttered me up from one end to the other and fed me a woeful tale of both poverty and neglect and how none of my fellow farriers would help her out with her very special animal. Well, I mean, she did a good job. I was feeling pretty puffed up and important and also a little curious to see this animal that she had described to me as a Z-donk. Now... If you don't know what a Z-donk is, it is an animal which is crossed from a zebra and a donkey. <laughs> now, I was brand new in this area and to this, and I was plying my trade, and often I had to pick up the jobs no one else wanted. That others more experienced than I had learned a long time ago, I don't answer that phone number when it pops up. <laughs> but I didn't know that. And, and this is what we call, for someone starting out, it's pretty common, it's called paying your dues. And so I was in that season of paying my dues to be a farrier. And so anyhow, I had this uh, call that came in. And, and I'll never forget, she assured me, it wouldn't be that hard. Like she really, <laughs> because she told me, you know, he's half the size of most of the other horses you deal with, the normal horses. He, he's a tiny little thing. Okay. And she explained to me the need was so great because my fellow farriers had neglected her and this poor special animal. And they wouldn't help her out. And so I was excited and intrigued and a little puffed up. And she told me the need was so great this would be the most satisfying $20 I had ever earned. I could usually trim a horse's four feet in about 15 to 18, 20 minutes. And it would pay $20, which back then, this is, you know, 24 years ago, it was... I was doing pretty good, especially if you showed up at a place that had 10 or 12 horses. You could spend a couple hours there and have a pretty good morning. And I had some clients like that, and I had scheduled them, but I was excited to go there. So I, I put her on my schedule, her and this little special animal of hers, right at the top of the schedule. I'll be there first thing in the morning. I'll knock this out, and then go on about my regular schedule. Sounds like an easy start. <laughs> well, I arrived early the next morning full of coffee and confidence, and I will spare you the gory details. I will just say that nine hours later, his hooves were trimmed, I was bruised and bloody, and she refused to pay me for all the trauma I had caused her little special animal. Now, I did not fully realize it at the time, but the Lord was letting me know that I might have been supposed to be in charge of all of his creation, but I wasn't yet. 
You know, that's right. God's original design has his special creation made in his image and exercising authority and dominion over all of his creation. But as we know, both by experience and truth, man has messed it up. From the beginning has chosen something less than God's plan, believing he could do it better, and man has been repeating that mistake ever since. This is not something we can look to Adam and Eve and blame them because we have not done better. We, in fact, have done worse. Man has sinned against God, and because of this, his rule, man's rule, has become twisted and superficial. Often because of sin, we see this in aberration to God's creation, where often rule and authority are accomplished by manipulation or even worse, brutality. As one pastor notes, we were made to do it, but we can't do it. And the saying, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely, is lived out before every generation from Adam forward. Another pastor, G.K. Chesterton, <clears throat> Chesterton, sums it up in this way. Whatever else is true about man, this one thing is certain. Man is not what he was meant to be. Amen. Now you may be wondering, well, how is this encouraging exactly? I'm glad Adam and Eve had a shot at it, but it's not like we do, right? This is not the Garden of Eden. How is this encouraging exactly? Well, we are getting to that. You see, God's original plan had man in the center of it, perfectly ruling over his created world. Fact. Man has made a mess of it. Fact. But God's plan is not done yet. Fact. And that's where we come to. God's plan for man is redeemed by a man. Right? We see the original. We see the mess. But that's not the end of the story. Verse 9. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels. Namely, Jesus because of the suffer, suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. And because the language is so similar, the crowning with glory and honor, a lot of people say, oh, well, that means Psalm 8 was speaking of Jesus in a messianic sense, but that's not the case. And that's not the case. Psalm 8 was speaking of mankind. Hey, David says, when I look at your creation, I'm boggled that you would give man the honor and glory that you do afford him. Here's the contrast. Verse 8, but we do not see. Verse 9, but we do see him. You see, he is our hope. He has done what we cannot. Take heart, brothers and sisters. Be encouraged even today. Adam messed it all up. And so has every Adam after him, except for one. That's the theme of the book of Revelation. When, when, when John is there and, and they say, who will open the scroll? Is there none who are worthy? And John begins to weep because none are worthy. But they say, take heart, man, because there is one who is worthy. Who is the one who is worthy? Who is the one who is seated at the right hand of the Father, having finished the work and glorified his name as he was sent and has now been restored to the glory which is his before the foundation of the world? There is only one. His name is Jesus. And he took on flesh and he bore the wrath of the Father so that we in our flesh might re be redeemed to the relationship of redemption that he has promised us through his labor of atonement upon the cross. And then through that we can look to him and see our future. That in Christ all things are possible. In him all things are being accomplished. In him we look ahead and say, oh, I can't see it. I don't know what it looks like, but I can look to him and see it. That's this picture. There is only one. There is a man who is more than a, ma a man as we've been seeing. There is a man who is God himself. And for a short while he took on humanity. And like us was a little lower than the angels. So that he took on flesh so that he might die. God could not die in his, in his eternal state. And so he took on flesh so that death might come upon him. And because of this, he might through death become redemption and eternal life for all who trust in him. Redemption to what? Well, minimally to God's original plan. It's still his original plan. God did not create the world, let man mess it up, and then say, well, we'll just leave it that way. No, God is able. Think about this. This is the, this is the, the crux of the struggle with the gospel. This is what the psalmist is wrestling with. Wait a second, God, you made it this way, and it was good. And you were careful and caring for, for your special creation, and you gave all of this. But he messed it up. He chose something less. So, God, I don't, I don't understand. Why didn't you just wipe him out? Build another one. 
Why, why go through all the brokenness and futility? Why do it this way? It's mind-boggling to me. And that's what Jesus speaks of in the Gospels. Uh, we studied it in Matthew. He says, it's mind-boggling that a smoldering wick he will not stuff out and a bruised reed he will not break. The picture is very simply this. If you were to ever look into, uh, we don't have reeds like this around here, but I was in Africa. There were, there were thousands of acres of reeds. And the children would use them. You can cut a reed and, and use it as a straw or make it into an instrument to, to make music and other things. And the point is, is it's an easy thing to get a new reed. So if you have a reed that you are in the process of trying to make a flute or a straw out of and it cracked or broke or something in it didn't go the way it should, throw that sucker away and grab another one. And that's the point. If God who made humans has humans rejecting and rebelling against him, choosing the lies of a snake over his truth and provision, why not destroy them and start over? It's mind-boggling that he would love us so much that he would send his actual only begotten son that he might redeem us unto himself. This is amazing grace. Minimally, he has redeemed us unto his original plan because he's not going to take, this is my plan, but I'm going to react to man and I'm going to change my plan and change my plan and change my plan. No, it's still his original plan and it's going to come to fruition. He just had to do it himself. That's the point. Man couldn't do it. He had to do it himself and he did. You see, Jesus succeeded where Adam failed. We look around and we see all that has failed. We experience the futility this world is subjected to. We have miniature donkeys that kick us all over the place. And, and we deal with all these struggles and everything else that comes. And we say, Lord, I don't think that I'm experiencing this subjection that you gave us. We see the failure. But when we look to Jesus, what we see is all that has been accomplished. All that has been promised. We see the fulfillment. We see the hope. We see the, the promise. That's why we, by faith, trust in him as our Lord and Savior and experience the fullness of all that he has given us in that faith. Right? We, we, we look around and we see all that's broken. And more than that, he has promised that when we trust in him and turn from our sin... Then we are both justified. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. We looked at that last week. However, when the Lord looks upon those who have been adopted by him, justified by the blood of his son, he looks upon those and he sees Christ's fulfillment. He sees Christ's perfection, Christ's righteousness that Christ gave to us when he took our sin upon the cross. As a matter of fact, we are so close to him, we are so intertwined with Christ that there can be no distinction. That's why Paul describes our relationship over 160 times in his writings as being in Christ. When he talks about your salvation, he says you are in Christ. You are in Christ. That's the description. And so what he has done, what he has accomplished, we shall partake. Because we are in him. This is the promise of our hope. Yes, here's God's original design. We can recognize the truth of it. We can experience the desire for it. We can also see the futility of, of the circumstances. Why? Because sin entered in and man has messed it up. But take heart because there is one, one who has accomplished the redeeming work that was promised. He has fulfilled the law of God. He has become the fulfillment of all of those things. He is the once for all sufficient sacrifice. And for all those who would trust in him, they themselves will be partakers with them for he has gone ahead to prepare a place that where he is we may be with him. That was the message for the Hebrews. It's the message for us. It's an unchanging message. If you're looking for a different message there's not one coming because this is the final word of God on his plan that he has now spoken through his son and there is not a new message coming. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to get there, but it's going to take a while, so I thought we'd jump ahead. It's one of my favorite sections in all of Scripture. What do we do in the meantime? What do we do in the meantime? Well, in Hebrews 12, the author is going to tell us. We're just going to read it. We won't take time with it because we are going to get there, but, but I want to remind us of this truth. What do we, what do, we do and the futility with the promise and the hope and the, the, the kind of middle world that we 
we're living in, right? We live between two Advents. We're about to celebrate uh, at the Christmas time, the first Advent of Christ. He came as a lamb, but we must never forget he is coming back. And when he comes back, there will be no lamb, right? He, he will be seated uh, upon a stallion and he will come making war and a sharp sword will come from his mouth and he will destroy his enemies and he will judge this world and he will cast his enemy Satan and all those who have stood against him into the pit. There, there, is, there is a difference and we live in the tension between those two things where, where this salvation has been accomplished by the sacrifice of the lamb who, who, who went before making no sound but, but was led willing to be that sacrifice but we live awaiting the return of the triumphant king uh, the one who will restore all things so in the meantime until that happens we, we live expectantly because he will come like a thief in the night we live ready we spend our time in Matthew 24 being reminded stay ready because you're not going to be able to get ready in that, here's how we do that. Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Verse 9 says, have you considered Jesus? Hebrews chapter 12 verse 3 says, have you considered Jesus? You know, that's, that's really the better answer that we oftentimes jump over because we think it's too simplistic. But no, when you consider whatever struggle you're facing, when you consider whatever worry you have, you should begin by considering Jesus. When you consider who he is, what he has done, what he has proven, and what he has promised, there's really nothing that you're facing, struggling against, fighting with, or dealing with, it won't be overcome if you'll look rightly to him. Have you considered Jesus? Because when you look around, it's broken. But remember this, it's we who broke it. And because of this, we don't experience what we were created to experience. And so we experience a deep and abiding futility in all of our endeavors because we still have within us what we were created to experience. This desire, this recognition of significance, this recognition of authority, this recognition of these things. We have that within us as those who were created in God's image. But it's been twisted. It's been marred. It's been tainted. And so we experience an even greater futility because we know we were made for better things. We know that we were created to know better than this. And when we experience that which is not, it's never quite enough. Have you ever noticed that when you pursue the world, it's never quite enough? $100 should be $200, $1,000 should be $5,000, a million should be the second million, right? This, this next career, this next this, this next whatever it is that's going to make me happy never actually does it because once you get it, then you worry about what's next. This new car, it's just a payment. This new this, it's just a struggle. It's who we are. By God's grace, he subjected us to this futility. And it's never quite enough. Nothing this world can give us is ever quite enough. Why? Because we know that we were created for something more. Something indescribably better. And we labor in this world. Even as we are not of this world any longer. And so the futility is more painful. We're here. It's broken. We did it. But we've been redeemed. And we await the fulfillment of those things. We are created for greater things. And take heart. Those greater things are coming. They are coming. And even as you can't see them in circumstance or society. When you look by faith to Christ, you will see them. And what he is, is the promise of what we shall be. For we shall be with him. And we who have trusted in him are those who are in him. You may feel insignificant, frustrated, and even fearful as you look around and consider things. But I say to you this morning on the authority of God's word that you have infinite value. You are just a little lower than the angel's. But you will be crowned with glory and honor. And all things will be subject to you. And futility and fear will be placed for permanence under your feet. Now you may be saying, I just can't see it. I, ju I just see the brokenness. And I say to you, but you can see Jesus. 
He's revealed himself. You can see Jesus. You can know Jesus. He has, he has taken the time to reveal himself in the fullness of who he is. He's done it multiple different ways from the prophets to the promises to the covenants to the, to the gospel authors to the church. He, he has revealed himself continually and repeatedly. You might not be able to see it. As a matter of fact, you will never see it if you're looking outside of Christ. But if you look to him, you can see it, for he himself has suffered in the flesh. He himself has suffered temptation just as we. He himself has suffered death, but he has defeated death, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, crowned with glory and honor, that we might look to him. He is our promise of God's ultimate plan for each of us who have trusted in him. If you have done so, then know this, there is nothing insignificant nor lacking about you any longer, no matter what this world tells you you pray with me this morning? Lord, we are thankful for your precious promises. We know that they're precious because you paid for them with, with a great and dear cost, your own blood, your own righteousness. And Lord, as we gather this morning and we consider these things and we look to the future and we don't understand, Lord, I, I cannot begin to wrap my mind around what it was like in the garden, much less what it will be like in heaven. And you tell us that's the way it ought to be for you have promised us something which no mind can conceive of. Our greatest and wildest imagination and thoughts cannot come to the conclusion of what you have actually prepared for us. Lord, your love is, is beyond amazing that you would look to me in my rebellion and my rejection and my brokenness and my sin that you in your holiness would yet love me and make a way through the sacrifice of your own son so that there might be a bridge, a connection, one who would mediate this relationship. An umpire, as Job calls him, a mediator, as Paul calls him in Timothy. And that is your son, Lord. This is grace beyond amazing. Would we be boggled even yet today as we consider these things? Lord, I ask for this because of your word, according to your promise. And in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. I invite you.